this is Lindsay Clark, your primary instructor for current topics in medical laboratory sciences, and this is lecture 20, specimen collection and processing part 2. The objectives for today's lecture, number one, recognize common specimen issues and discuss prevention techniques. Number two, identify test results that may be affected by different specimen issues. Number three, describe special processing techniques and explain situations where these techniques would be required. Number four, list different specimen storage conditions and the corresponding temperature ranges. And number five, outline requirements for transport and shipping of biohazard specimens. So here's our lecture outline for today. I know that you guys are so excited, so let's get to it. We are going to talk about common specimen issues, how to prevent them, and which lab results might be affected. We will discuss the different storage conditions for specimens and then special processing that might be required, like stat specimens or those that require chain of custody documentation. And finally, we will talk about shipping and transporting biohazards, which includes most laboratory specimens. One of the most common specimen issues we see in the lab is hemolysis. So hemolysis occurs when red blood cells are lysed, um, the hemoglobin gets released, and the serum or plasma turns a reddish color. So you can see in the image the varying degrees of hemolysis with number one tube being little to no hemolysis and the number four tube being grossly hemolyzed. So how does this happen? Well, a lot of it has to do with phlebotomy technique. If the needle that is being used is too small or if the syringe plunger is pulled all the way back, the red cells kind of shoot through the needle and they'll lice when they hit the syringe walls. And if a sample is vigorously shaken after collection, that can also cause the red cells to lice. And we always want to educate anyone who draws blood to invert gently, not shake those tubes. Hemolysis can also occur when whole blood is frozen or if it sits too close to a heat source. So be aware also that patients can have intravascular hemolysis, so it's not always a blood draw issue, but a lot of times it is. And hemolysis can be prevented with good phlebotomy techniques. Also, make sure you separate your serum or plasma um, before freezing and keep those tubes away from any heat sources you might have in the lab. And hemolysis does affect certain lab results and sometimes it depends on which test methodology that you're using. For the most part, any lab test um, that is a light scatter or absorbance test, a light absorbance test is going to be affected by hemolysis. Um, hematology tests that might be infected, affected can include your red count, your hematocrit, and your packed cell volume. And the chemistries affected include potassium as well as some of your cardiac enzymes like your CK. And one final note, you guys know I like to give nurses a hard time and it's all in good fun, um, but in all seriousness, some nurses believe that centrifuge, um, centrifuging specimens can hemolyze them. So you guys know this is not the case, um, but always keep in mind that this is a really good opportunity for education, um, to educate those who just have never been taught. Um, when calling for recollect, if they are receptive, you can always try to educate um, whoever draws the blood at your facility um, so that they can avoid hemolysis in the future. And this goes also for any clotting, pouring tubes into one another, IV contamination, anything like that. Um, it's not always the nurses. Sometimes it's nursing staff like your medical assistants or your patient care techs. Um, but just let them know it's better for everybody. It's better for them. They don't get so frustrated with us. It's better for us because we can run our testing uh, quicker and it's obviously better for the patient as well. So I'm a huge, huge advocate for um, educating those that have just never, never been taught. So moving on. So hemoconcentration can happen um, 
when the tourniquet is left on too long. So what happens, the liquid part of the blood can flow past the tourniquet easier than the red cells, and the red cells kind of get trapped below the tourniquet. The result is a greater concentration of blood cells um, versus the liquid portion of the blood in your tube. And evaporation is a related issue. Say you're working with a specimen and you set that tube down in a rack and it's not capped, doesn't have the top on it, and it maybe gets left there for a little while because you're busy. Um, so if it's left there for too long, water in the serum or plasma can start to evaporate. And again, this leaves a greater concentration of red cells um, versus the liquid part of the blood. So these issues can falsely indicate dehydration, um, and they may affect other analytes by leaving them more concentrated as well. So to prevent hemoconcentration or evaporation, always make sure your tourniquet is not left on too long, and always cap your samples when you're not using them. Lipemia is another specimen issue that is not uncommon in the lab. It's usually caused by increased triglycerides, chylomicron specifically, um, but can also be seen in patients with diabetes mellitus or pancreatitis. So the most common cause of lipemia is inadequate timing of blood collection. Basically, the patient was not fasting or did not fast long enough. So, one way to prevent lipemia, um, specimens should always be drawn from patients who have been fasting for at least 12 hours. I know that that's not always possible in the really real world, um, but ideally that's when we would draw. Now similar to hemolysis, lipemia will affect light scatter tests or those absorbance tests. So your hemoglobin and related indices, as well as bilirubin and some of your electrolytes um, are probably going to be affected by lipemia. Icteric samples will appear yellowish in color. And this is caused by the buildup of bilirubin. And so you can see in the image to the right here the varying degrees of icterus from 0 to 4 plus. So this really can't be prevented with phlebotomy technique so much um, or fasting. And so this is something you kind of have to make notes on um, occasionally with your results. So lab results that are affected, of course, bilirubin, um, but it may also affect your creatinine and total protein. And again, the test results that are affected are going to vary depending on which test methodology you are using in your lab. So always be mindful of what methodology you're using and how these specimen issues may affect the different results. And also be aware of how you might resolve these issues. Some blood collection tubes are made to allow the blood to clot so that when it spun down, we get serum. So this would include your gold tops, red tops, tiger tops, and so on. However, a lot of our tubes have additives um, in there that are actually meant to prevent clotting. So your EDTA tubes, your purple tops, is one of the most common tubes um, that does contain an additive to prevent clotting. But sometimes clots still happen. So this can be the result of inadequate mixing of the tube after it's drawn, um, blood being drawn in a syringe, and maybe that syringe sits too long before the blood's transferred into a tube, or if it's a slow draw or a difficult draw, it can cause that blood to clot. To prevent clotting, you really should invert the tube. Remember, we don't want to shake it because that can cause hemolysis, which gives us another problem. So we want to gently invert the tube about 8 to 10 times, and you want to do that pretty soon after it is filled. And now if you use a syringe to draw, the tube should be filled quickly after you're done drawing. And the main lab results affected by clotting are going to be your platelet count, because your platelets are all used up in that clot. Um, any coagulation testing is definitely going to be affected, um, and your CBC will definitely be affected. So something I want to make you guys aware of, you may already know this, but occasionally the nurses or nursing staff, whoever tries to, um, whoever draws your blood to your institution, 
they will try to pull clots out of the tubes before they send them to the lab. So they will catch on that you call them anytime a specimen is clotted for a redraw. And so trying to sort of remedy that situation, they'll just pull the clot out if they notice it's in there um, and then send that to the lab. So you are likely still going to get erroneous results on these and you'll catch on to maybe what's going on. Again, this is another great opportunity to reach out and explain to them why um, you can't just pull the clot out of the specimen. QNS is something you guys have probably all heard before. So it just means quantity not sufficient, meaning not enough sample to run the requested test. So this can happen, again, if it's a short draw or maybe a really difficult draw. Um, if the tubes are expired, they may not have uh, adequate vacuum left in them um, to draw the correct amount of blood. So to prevent this, you always want to check your expiration dates on your tubes and really all of your supplies. Um, don't pierce the top of the tube until you're ready if it's one of the evacuated tubes. Um, and don't pop that top off um, if you intend to use that as a, an evacuated tube in the future because it releases that vacuum and then won't draw in the proper amount of blood. So the lab results affected by Q&S specimens, um, generally you're probably not going to get results on these specimens. Usually you're going to have to call and have it um, redrawn. And again, I like to give nurses a hard time, and it's all in good fun. I love nurses. Some of my best friends are nurses. Bacterial contamination. This can happen when the puncture site is not properly cleansed. Or if you cleanse the site, maybe you cleansed it really, really well, but then you go and repalpate it after you cleanse it, it can get recontaminated and you end up with contamination. If your supplies are not sterile or if they're expired, um, this can also lead to contamination. To prevent this, always cleanse your puncture site really well. Make sure you don't repalpate it. Check to make sure all of your sterile supplies is still sealed um, and that they're not expired. So bacterial contamination is mostly going to affect your cultures, so your blood cultures, your spinal fluid cultures, joint fluids, um, and so on, anything that should be sterile. And I know we've talked about blood cultures a bit already, but just a reminder, um, working up a contaminant, whether it's a blood culture, a joint fluid, a spinal fluid, whatever, can be very, it can be very costly, it can be time consuming, and it can possibly lead to unnecessary treatment for the patient. So this is why we stress proper technique, especially when you're drawing your blood cultures. It's so, so, so important. Specimens can be contaminated by chemicals in a couple different ways. So occasionally, whoever draws your blood at your facility, um, generally the nursing staff is the, is, are the only ones allowed to draw from a patient's IV line. So occasionally, if they're a hard stick, they're not able to draw from this patient very easily, then they will draw blood from the IV line. The proper procedure for this is to actually stop or pause that IV for a period of time, whether that's 15 minutes, 30 minutes, um, whatever their policy states. And then you should draw a waste tube or draw out a certain amount of blood into a syringe that should be discarded. Um, and that is to help pull any fluid or anything in that tube out so that when you're drawing, you're only getting the blood. But this does not always happen. Sometimes IV fluids or uh, meds, whatever's hanging, they get mixed in with the specimens. So I know all you chemistry folks out there probably know exactly how to tell when this has happened. Um, for the rest of us, let's kind of think through this for a minute. So if your specimen is contaminated with normal saline, which is 0.9% sodium chloride, you should notice that your sodium and chloride results are going to be increased. 
If your patient has a potassium drip and that contaminates your specimen, the potassium result is likely going to be so out of range that it's just not compatible with life. Um, another common IV fluid that's used is a lactated ringers fluid. Um, this contains electrolytes. And in this case, any electrolytes that you run on that specimen are going to be falsely elevated. So nurses and nursing staff often receive very little education on um, tubes and additives and what they do and why. Sometimes they just don't understand that you can't pour a green top into a purple top or a purple top into a blue top or so on and so on. So every now and then you might get one of these specimens in the lab. Um, and so thinking through this, let's think about our additives in our tubes. If we have an EDTA purple top that contains potassium, you will know what you should expect to see. Your green tops contain sodium or lithium heparin and your coag tubes contain sodium as well. So you can imagine that your test results are still going to be inaccurate if you receive one of these specimens um, in much the same way that they would if you received a specimen that was contaminated with IV fluids. So again, um, hematology as well as chemistry folks, I know that you guys can probably spot these from a mile away. Um, you should impart that knowledge on those um, new folks coming in and let them know how to identify these types of specimens and how to correct it. So I just want to quickly mention some different storage conditions for specimens. Um, you guys are probably familiar with this. Specimens are usually going to be stored either ambient temperature, refrigerated, or frozen. It's important to know your acceptable ranges in your lab. The ranges that are listed here are really more of a general guideline, but your lab is probably not too much different from this. And you should also be familiar with any storage conditions required for specimens that are being sent out to a reference lab. Make sure you ship those specimens accordingly. So if it needs to be sent frozen um, on dry ice, you need to make sure that that happens because if you send this specimen out, the reference lab doesn't receive it until tomorrow. Uh, maybe they don't accession it until tomorrow second shift and so they don't call you until the day after to tell you they can't accept their specimen. Now your patient's been discharged. It's really, really difficult to get a redraw. So just always make sure you're following your reference lab's guidelines for storage conditions especially. So you may run into some specimens that require special processing every now and then. Stat specimens are those that need to be run immediately and they can include spinal fluid, um, maybe some other fluids, um, possibly things from the OR, um, and definitely your trauma specimens. Anybody that comes into the ER that's a true emergency, um, those need to be run stat. So the image of the card here is kind of just for giggles, but also I have actually seen ESRs and cultures ordered stat. Um, I'm sure that you guys have too. So it can be a good idea to call for clarification on these types of things if you're able to. Um, generally, if they're gonna, if they're ordering a culture stat, what they actually want is the gram stain stat, not necessarily the culture. So always watch for those types of things and if you're able, call for some clarification or um, call to notify them that you're not able to do that test stat and let them know how long it will be for results. Something else to know is that some specimens must be protected from light. So bilirubin really should be, although it's not always. Um, your vitamin B1, B2, vitamin K, porphyrins, urine, porphyrinogen, folate, and several others um, are also on that list. So the image of the brown tube at the bottom here is an example of a pour over tube that can be used to protect your specimen from light. And you can actually pour over serum, plasma, or whole blood into this tube. So if you have maybe an EDTA tube that you need to send off for testing, it's a protect from light, you can actually pour that whole tube over into this brown tube. 
Um, alternatively, you can wrap the tube in aluminum foil. Um, I've seen that done as well. And it works pretty well. Sometimes um, you'll also see reagents that come like in an amber colored bottle instead of a clear bottle and that's really for the same reason. So those reagents are probably light sensitive and that's why they're in that darker colored bottle. So kind of same, same idea there. Some tests are also going to require your specimens to be sent down on ice. So lactic acid and ammonia are the two major ones. Um, these often need to also be run in a certain time frame as well. So make sure you know your policy for that. If it needs to be run within 30 minutes, um, if it needs to be run within 20 minutes, um, you always need to make sure that you know that and especially make sure if you have um, folks that do processing for you, make sure that they know that as well so they can get those to you immediately. And finally, let's talk for a second about chain of custody specimens. Now this is something that most of you will likely not have to deal with, but I want you to be aware of it um, just in case you do come across it at some point. Any specimen collected that has results that may be used in court really should follow the chain of custody protocols. So this would be tests like drug tests, blood alcohol levels, um, or rape kits, anything like that. And your chain of custody protocols are going to outline your documentation requirements for that specimen. So basically, the specimen collection and handling from the minute it's collected until its final disposal are all documented. Tubes or cups collected are usually going to have a tamper evidence seal adhered to them for transporting or shipping. And it is critical to document things correctly for these specimens. So people have actually had charges dropped um, due to errors in this process. So an example, I believe all of you had a drug screen for this program. So when you went in and gave your specimen and they had you sign paperwork and they put those little labels on the cup and maybe you initialed those, um, that is an example of chain of custody specimen. That way when the results come back, um, you can be confident that that specimen was not tampered with. Specimen shipping and transport is pretty heavily regulated, so I want to spend a few minutes talking about this. Um, different agencies that are involved in regulation of shipping and transport include the International Air Transport Association, or IATA, your U.S. Department of Transportation, or DOT, the U.S. Postal Service, OSHA, the U.S. Public Health Service, and a couple of others, like the United Nations actually has some regulations for this. So I want to stress that anyone involved in packaging and shipping infectious substances, which includes human blood, cultures, pretty much all laboratory specimens, they must be trained initially upon hire and annually thereafter. So if you are involved in this in any way, if you pack up and send specimens out, just make sure that you keep your training um, and your competencies up and, and do them annually. So a quick side note here, the image of the drone over here carrying a package is included on this slide because there is a hospital in North Carolina that has actually started using drones to fly lab specimens between buildings on their campus. So this kind of transport could be on the horizon for other places also, especially some of the larger campuses. Now I'm sure that they have to follow the standard safety precautions, but it may be that we see additional safety regulations added for this specific situation in the future. So I think that will be really interesting to watch and kind of see um, what happens with that. Now, when shipping or transporting biohazardous agents, um, also we use the phrase infectious substances, um, these must be packaged so that PPE is not required during transport. PPE shouldn't be worn in public corridors um, in your facility, in your hospital or clinic. 
So make sure that you're not carrying your blood tubes across campus with your gloves on because that's really gross. People see it. They think that everything that you touch is contaminated, even if they're clean gloves. So just don't wear your PPE out in the public areas in the hospital. Now these packages must also be packed in a way that will maintain the integrity of the specimen and prevent accidental release. So you don't want that, spe that specimen to be accidentally um, dropped and the tube pops open and there's blood everywhere because now you have to clean it up and explain to everybody that's okay like this isn't infectious or at least we don't think it is um, so you want to prevent that situation for sure transporting specimens within buildings so this is the UAMS policy but these guidelines are very standard um, and I'd be surprised if your guidelines are much different than this so if you're transporting within the building your specimen must be in a leak proof primary container now your primary container can be your vacutainer tube that can be primary it's leak proof make sure the lid is on tight good to go there so the primary container must then be placed in a leak proof secondary container this can be a sealed plastic biohazard bag so I have an image here to the left you guys have probably all seen these um, as long as it is well sealed that is um, acceptable as a secondary container for transporting within the same building so when transporting specimens between buildings, so if you're going to leave one building and go to another building um, on the same campus, again, this is a UAMS policy, but I bet yours is probably very, very similar. Um, your primary container must be placed in the secondary container with some absorbent material. So if you look at the image of the biohazard bag I have here, you can see there's a little kind of white rectangle thing inside. Um, that's actually a piece of absorbent material. So a lot of these bags will come with that absorbent material already inside. Um, if not, you can actually use a paper towel. That's acceptable. So your vacutainer and your paper towel in the plastic bag. That's your primary container, your absorbent material, and your secondary container. Now, in order to transport this between buildings, this must now be placed into an outer transport container um, something like a rigid cooler not like a soft-sided cooler or at least here at UAMS um, it needs to be a rigid cooler so I have an image here of a, an acceptable um, outer transport container and you can see it has the biohazard label on it and it also marks it for specimens only um, don't put your food in there because gross So if your institution or facility uses couriers to transport materials um, and maybe they go across campus or maybe they take your specimens to the parent hospital in the next town over or wherever they take your specimens, um, they must be trained in specimen transport. So anyone transporting materials that is not the original packager would be considered a courier. Um, in this case, the packaging requirements are the same as when transporting specimens between buildings on campus, except the outer transport container must include a biohazard label, the identification of the material being transported, so human blood, cultures, etc. On this, you don't want to get too specific. If you're sending something over, um, you don't want to just be super specific I've got cultures of MRSA in here like don't just say you're sending over cultures um, it also label needs to have the information for the person receiving the specimen so their name department uh, what building their box number and a phone number and then the name and phone number of whoever is sending and the date that it is sent so it's usually a good idea also to have your courier sign out specimens when they pick them up and then sign them in when they are delivered to the final destination. That helps you kind of keep track when was it picked up, when was it delivered, um, those kinds of things. And again, I just want to stress that anyone involved in packaging, transporting, or shipping materials must be trained annually. So make sure that your couriers are properly trained. 
Shipping specimens via air has some special requirements. So depending on what kind of specimen you are shipping, whether it is an exempt specimen, a category B, or a category A specimen, the requirements are going to be a little bit different for each of those. The type of packaging used, the labels that are required, any permits, and paperwork that must accompany the specimen, um, that is those requirements are all outlined in shipping regulations and they should also be outlined in your facility shipping policies and procedures. Uh, the images here are some examples of labels that may be required as well as at the bottom there that's a shipper's declaration form and that's going to be required for category A specimens anytime you send a category A specimen. Um, the one at the top to the right that's got the thick black lines on it, that's anytime you ship dry ice, you have to have that label on the outside. And then the one to the left is um, a class six infectious substance. So that's something you would use um, for a category B specimen. You would put that label on the outside of the package. So be familiar with where you're shipping. Um, policies and procedures are, be familiar with what they say, um, a lot of this stuff you can find, so OSHA outlines it, IATA outlines it, um, so it's fairly easy to find the regulations for these. Some special considerations for shipping. When shipping or transporting a specimen on dry ice, it is essential that it is packaged appropriately. So if you seal up a package and it, it, the dry ice that's in it is not allowed to breathe, essentially, it's not allowed to kind of vent, um, dry ice can and will explode. So always make sure that any package with dry ice in it is vented enough to prevent that from happening. So the image here to the right is an image of um, a dry ice uh, explosion. So you can see that's a pretty big explosion that could cause some damage. So you want to make sure that you are careful with dry ice. There are also limits on the volume of chemicals that can be shipped um, in this situation. So for example, any pathology specimens that are in formalin or ethanol can only be shipped in small quantities. Um, these are also going to require special documentation and labels for shipping, so you want to make sure um, that you look over those regulations if you're shipping any of these specimens. Generally, these uh, little formalin containers, the smaller ones, are going to be acceptable for shipping. Um, some of the bigger ones might actually exceed the limit, and so you want to make sure um, that you're following all of those regulations. So I wanted to throw these images in there because these are really good illustrations of packaging requirements for category B specimens and category A specimens. So side by side, you can sort of see the differences in what is required for each. Now category B specimens are going to be those that do not meet the criteria for category A classification. Some examples, Burkholderia sepatia um, in culture form your MRSA in culture form and serum or plasma for a hepatitis B panel. These can all be sent um, category B. And category A specimens are those that are capable of causing permanent disability, life-threatening, or fatal disease. So some examples of that would include bacillus anthracis or bacillus anthracis culture form. Uh, Brucellus abortus in culture form or Ebola virus. Um, a list of these category A specimens can be found pretty easily and it's generally the big stuff like the big guns that you would not want anybody um, to have out in the open around you because it can cause serious illness. So if you are uncertain or unsure of what you're shipping, what classification it should be in, you should always consult with your biosafety person on your campus or consult with a biosafety person. Um, and be aware too there is an exempt category so a lot of things that get shipped out um, from the lab they may fall in that exempt category. If you have a contract with a reference lab and they send a courier to pick up your specimens, um, they 
should be trained by the company they work for. So if you use ARUP for a reference lab um, and they come and pick up your specimens, that courier should be trained by ARUP in proper specimen handling. Um, and they will come and pick those up, do the final packaging, and then take those to be shipped. So that's lecture 20. I know there were regulations involved, so I hope that you are still awake and that your mind is not completely numb. Um, if you guys have any questions, comments, or concerns, please get in touch with me. The shipping regulations can be a little overwhelming, so if you are responsible for that at your hospital, you have any questions, um, feel free to contact me and I can help you. And if I can't, I probably know somebody that can. Um, I did a lot of work with shipping regulations as well in um, completing my master's degree. So I met a lot of people through doing that and have um, a lot of connections that are more than happy to help out um, in these situations. So feel free to contact me, questions, comments, concerns, um, and we'll catch you guys for lecture 21.